All right, welcome to our second seminar of the fall ASU Center for Evolution and Medicine uh, seminar speaker series. Today, we welcome most enthusiastically ASU alumna, Professor Carrie Villieu. Carrie is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Anatomy at Midwestern University in Arizona. Uh, professor Villieu investigates population genetic and phylogenetic approaches to explore the evolution and ecology of human, non-human primate and mammal sensory genes, including opsin genes, olfactory receptor genes, taste receptors, and mechanoreceptor genes. So um, I'm sure we'll hear some about that today. Uh, Professor Villieu earned her BA in anthropology and with a psychology minor, minor here at Barrett Honors College at Arizona State University uh, in 2004 under uh, advisor Leanne Nash, who is an emeritus professor within the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. She went on to earn her PhD in biological anthropology under uh, our friend Chris Kirk at the University of Texas at Austin in May 2012. Uh, in the meantime, she has served as a postdoctoral researcher and scholar, uh, both in anthropology and archaeology at the University of Calgary, the University of North Texas High School, uh, Health Science Center and at uh, University of Texas at Austin. I have been following Professor Villieu's research program since she was recognized as runner-up in the Outstanding Student Presentation at the 2011 American Society of Primatologists uh, Conference in 2011. Uh, the next year in 2012, she went on to earn the Outstanding Student Award in Anthropological Genetics at the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Uh, she has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Leakey Foundation, and the Wintergren Foundation, aka what we consider the funding hat trick in anthropology. So uh, please uh, gather with me, <laughs> unmute yourselves to uh, applause and welcome Professor Carrie Value uh, to present to us in the seminar today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful yeah. introduction. Hi, yeah, it's great to be here, even virtually talking to you guys about um, my research on sensory systems in primates and their ecology and evolution. And Dr. Hine gave a great introduction. I am an assistant professor in the anatomy department at Midwestern, um, just down the road in Glendale. I just started here this summer. I got my PhD at UT Austin. Um, I did a postdoc at Yale, the University of Calgary, the University of North Texas, and then back to UT Austin before coming here to Midwestern. But what's super fun and fulfilling for me, giving this talk to you guys right now, is that 20 years ago today, I was a freshman at ASU taking my very first biological anthropology course. So for the first time, I was learning all about primates, primate ecology, biological adaptations in humans and primates. And I had no idea at the time that this is where my career would end up 20 years later. So being here at ASU, um, even virtually, is really exciting and fun. So I research is focused on exploring the ecology and evolution of sensory systems in primates, humans, and other mammals. Um, and I focus on the senses because they mediate our relationships with the external world. They're our portal for perceiving, interacting, and experiencing the outside world, and also the inside world, but that's a completely different lecture. And thinking about it, senses are critical for finding food, detecting predators, moving about your environment, and interacting with other individuals. So if you're interested in questions of evolutionary adaptation like I am, the senses are a pretty awesome focus because of how tightly linked they are to the environment. So you often see their frequent targets of adaptation to ecological and sometimes social selective pressures. So today I'm gonna to start with sort of a brief primer on sensory system variation that we see in primates um, before shifting to talk about a recent project that we're wrapping up looking at sensory behaviors and proxies of sensory reliance. And we see a lot of variation in primate sensory systems, both across species and within species. And what I mean by variation is differences between and within species in sensory structures, like the main olfactory bulb volume, sensory genes, like the genes underlying color vision, and sensory function, like the ability to detect fine details. And exploring these differences can help us understand how evolution has shaped sensory perception in a species or in a higher taxonomic clades, like the primate order. And we may be able to better understand ancestral ecology or the selective forces shaping primate and human evolution by looking at these relationships between sensory systems and ecology in living primates and mammals. 
For example, um, compared to other mammals, primates exhibit a greater emphasis on vision. We see a, that in the evolution of forward-facing eyes, of the evolution of a postorbital bar or postorbital closure, with the larger proportion of the brain devoted to vision, and with the evolution of more complex forms of color vision. We also see in anthropoid primates, so monkeys, apes, and humans, the evolution of extremely high visual acuity or resolution. So that's the ability to see fine details. What, when you go to the eye doctor, they test with a snow and eye test. And in fact, the only vertebrates that can see as well or better than humans and other anthropoids are diurnal raptors like eagles and hawks. Nothing else compares to um, our vision among vertebrates. So this can give us insight into what ecological factors may have influenced the origin of primates or the origin of anthropoid primates, knowing these sort of differences uh, in variation in sensory systems. Primates as a group also have a greater emphasis on manual grasping and manual dexterity compared to other mammals. And this emphasis on enhanced manual dexterity and touch is especially prominent in humans, where it was likely important in the evolution of tool manufacture. So, um, sorry. Here's just a picture of my daughter when she was five, who used that awesome human dexterity to sew a stuffed skull. And what's really fun about the senses is that we also see substantial variation within species. And these differences within species can have tangible effects on the health and behavior of individuals. For example, color vision is one of the most well-studied sensory systems where we see a lot of intraspecific sensory variation. Most humans, um, as well as apes and old world monkeys, so all catarines, have what's called routine trichromatic color vision, which means that we have three types of cones in our retinas, um, blue sensitive, green sensitive, and red sensitive cones. And so we can tell blues apart from yellows and greens apart from reds. And these opsin proteins in the cones are encoded by separate genes. The S opsin gene for the blue sensitive cone, the M opsin gene for the green sensitive cone, and the L opsin gene for the red sensitive cone. And these M and L genes are on the X chromosome. But most non-primate mammals have what's called dichromatic color vision. So they only have a single ML opsin gene and thus two cone types, a blue sensitive cone and a reddish or a greenish sensitive cone, which means that they can only discriminate blues from yellows. They can't tell reds apart from greens. And so they're missing that sort of whole channel of color. And in fact, up to 10% of human men have some form of color vision defect like dichromacy due to mutations in the M and L opsin genes. And like other mammals, neotropical monkeys and lemurs also only have a single ML opsin gene. But what's really neat about these groups is that many of them, like the shefauk here, have evolved allelic variation at critical sites within the gene that can actually change the color that their cone is most sensitive to. And there are three major single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in the ML opsin gene that leads to this functional difference in color vision. So what you end up seeing is color vision variation in function within a single social group. So all males have only one X chromosome, so they're dichromats. They have a blue sensitive cone and either a reddish or a greenish sensitive cone. Homozygous females, so those that have two copies of the same ML opsin allele, will be dichromats. But if a female inherits two different alleles from her parents, she can achieve trichromatic color vision. And so she can discriminate reds from greens. So in this polymorphic trichromatic system, you can actually compare feeding behaviors, visual function, or health outcomes between dichromats and trichromats within a social group or within a population, which is really cool. And myself and some colleagues at UT Austin did this in a paper looking at wild populations of rose shefauk in Krindi Mate National Park in Madagascar. So this is a picture of a harufi fruit, um, which is eaten by shefauk, and as viewed by a trichromat on the left and a dichromat on the right. And the red ripening cue of the fruit is detectable to the trichromat, you can see, um, but not to the dichromat. And we found that trichromat females spent more time eating fruit and had a higher BMI than dichromats. But what was really neat is that this benefit of trichromacy also extended to dichromats that were in the trichromat female social group. So a dichromat male got a health benefit, had a higher BMI because he hung out with a trichromat female who presumably led him to the better food sources. So another sense where we see substantial intraspecific variation is taste. 
And the most well studied is the TACE2R38 gene or the PTC gene. Um, and you guys may have done those PTC paper strips at some point in your school career. They're for um, detecting whether you taste phenothiocarbamide, which is a bitter compound found in cruciferous vegetables and a few other plant uh, plants. And there are three SNPs in the TASTE2R38 gene that affect whether an individual tastes the compound as bitter or not. And a few other primate species also show variation in this PTC gene, including chimps, Japanese macaques, and Neanderthals. And in fact, in Japanese macaques, we see evidence of local adaptation in the PTC gene. This is where a population differs from other populations as an adaptation to its local ecology. So the non-taster PTC genotype, where they don't taste it as bitter, is found at a moderately high frequency in one population of macaques, but is completely absent in other populations in, across Japan. And so the authors, Hashido Suzuki and colleagues, suggest this might relate to um, plants eaten by this one population that are high in things that the taste to R38 gene are, detects. Interspecific variation in olfaction has been relatively less comprehensively studied just because there are so many olfactory receptor genes that contribute to smell. And there are around 400 functional ones in humans. And in the olfactory system, the number of different odors an animal can detect is related to the number of functional OR, olfactory receptor genes, it has. But there's substantial variation across humans in OR gene repertoires. Um, just a 2019 study looked at a sample of 332 individuals and found 276 different OR genotypes. So a large proportion of their sample had a unique OR um, repertoire. And these repertoires they found were associated with differences in sensory perception across the individuals in their study. And um, in fact, I'm part of a project where we're looking at the effects of subsistence strategy on the evolution of olfactory gene and taste receptor gene repertoires in humans, where we're comparing rainforest hunter-gatherers and farmers in Uganda and the Philippines to see if there's any local adaptation for hunting and gathering or for agriculture. So thinking about it in the context of the seminar, sensory ecology and evolution can offer important insights for evolutionary medicine. For example, understanding intraspecific and interspecific variation in primate sensory systems can contextualize variation we see in human sensory systems. So thinking about the, one, the, the variation I've already talked about, studies have found that in other catarine primates like chimps and macaques, the incidence of color vision defects is substantially lower than what we observe in human populations. So in macaques, 0.4% of males out of 744 sampled had color vision defects. And in chimps, it was 2%, so one male out of the 58 sampled. But in human populations, it can vary between 2 and 10% of men having some form of color vision defect. So there may have been a shift during human evolution, leading to the evolution of a higher incidence of color vision defects in some human populations. For taste, variation in PTC sensitivity and taste to our 38 phenotypes is associated with obesity, as well as food preferences in adults and children. So exploring the evolution of this variation in other primates can help us understand why it's maintained in modern humans. Understanding the links between ecology and sensory adaptations in other primates can also help us identify selective factors and aspects of ancestral ecology and human evolution. And finally, understanding the evolutionary history of primate sensory adaptations can help us identify appropriate models for investigating human sensory physiology. For example, given the highly derived visual acuity we see in anthropoid primates, rodent models may not be appropriate for some questions about human visual system function. And similarly, the highly derived adaptations for manual dexterity and touch um, that characterize primates, but also humans, may mean that rodent models are also not appropriate for some questions of mechanoreceptor physiology. And so knowing this evolutionary history and adaptations can help us make sure we're choosing the best models in um, medical physiology studies. So now I'm gonna shift and talk to you guys about our work exploring foraging behavior and proxies of sensory reliance in three sympatric monkeys in Costa Rica. And by we, I want to include all of my co-authors on this project. So 
this is an international collaboration and it includes researchers in Canada from the University of Calgary, um, Mexico from the University of Veracruz, Japan from the University of Tokyo um, and um, Kyushu University and the UK from the University of Salford. So comparative studies in sensory ecology often use anatomical or molecular adaptations as proxies for how important a given sense is to a particular species. And these proxies include things like the size of the main olfactory bulb or the number of functional olfactory receptor genes um, for olfaction. For touch, it could be the density of mechanoreceptors in the skin. For vision, things like the size of the optic foramen, the shape of the eye or the number of functional opsin genes. And for taste, things like the density of fungiform papillae on the tongue, which are where the taste buds are located, or the size of the functional taste receptor gene repertoire. And these types of comparative studies test for relationships between measures of sensory reliance and ecological factors, such as diet, activity pattern, or habitat type. And we're gonna focus on diet today because that's the topic of this talk. And in general, what they found is that frugivory, so a species, when a species eats has a greater proportion of the diet devoted to fruit, forgivery is associated with a greater reliance on olfaction, manual touch, and taste, presumably to detect fruit ripeness. And ripe fruits have higher sugar levels, they're gonna be more um, rewarding for, for an individual to find. While filivory or leaf eating is associated with a greater reliance on bitter taste perception to detect toxins and um, reduced reliance on olfaction and manual touch. These findings, however, are built on the assumption that the proxies actually represent the relative reliance of a species on a given sense ecologically. And there are a couple issues with this assumption. And in fact, one of the major ones is that there's a major lack of comparative behavioral data on how the senses are used during foraging by different species. Do frugivores, for example, sniff fruit more frequently than folivores? Um, do they actually touch fruit more often? Interspecific comparisons, particularly of sympatric species that share the same foods, are seriously lacking. And this is especially true for the non-visual um, senses, like olfaction, touch, and taste. Most of the work that has been done on this topic has been in captive primates. Laska and colleagues, for example, found that when exposed to a novel food item, spider monkeys use smell more often to investigate it, while squirrel monkeys use manual touch more often. But this kind of quantitative comparison from wild species is lacking. The second major issue is that there's little work actually comparing different proxies for the same sense to see if they reveal the same patterns. And in one of the only studies, um, including primates, Garrett and Stiper found a positive correlation between the surface area of the cribiform plate in the ethmoid bone, which represents the main olfactory epithelium where olfactory receptors are. And then and the size of the functional OR gene repertoire across 32 mammals. So they found that those two proxies, the genetic and the anatomy, seem to correlate. But a study of avian olfactory receptor gene repertoires and olfactory bulb volumes found that the snow petrel here, which is a seabird that is known behaviorally to rely on olfaction for foraging and navigation, had one of the largest relative olfactory bulb volumes, like you might expect, but it had one of the smallest OR gene repertoires. So if you were just looking at OR gene repertoire in these birds, you might conclude that olfaction was not that ecologically relevant to the snow petrel, which we know behaviorally it is. So we wanted to investigate these assumptions and actually explore the relationships between the senses used during foraging and anatomical and molecular proxies of sensory reliance in wild primates. And we had two major questions. First, do wild primate species vary in the sensory behaviors they use when assessing the same fruits? So do species differ in how often they use olfaction, touch, or taste during fruit investigation? And second, if species do differ in their use of sensory behaviors, are these behavioral differences predicted by dietary specialization? So do frugivores use olfaction, touch, or taste more frequently than folivores by sensory anatomy? Um, do species that sniff fruits more often have larger main olfactory bulbs or larger areas of olfactory epithelium in the nose? Or by sensory genetics. So again, using olfaction as an example, do species that use smell more often to investigate fruits have more functional olfactory receptor genes? 
And we explored these questions in three sympatric neotropical primates that exhibit different dietary specializations, but feed on some of the same fruit species. So black-handed spider monkeys are often considered ripe fruit specialists. White-faced capuchins are frugivore insectivores, so they consume a lot of fruit, but also insect prey. And mantled howler monkeys are folivores, so they eat leaves, but they also eat some fruit. To address the first question, we collected behavioral data on how the senses were used by each species during fruit investigation. Most of our data were collected at Sector Santa Rosa, which is a tropical dry forest in the area de Conservación Guanacosta in northwestern Costa Rica. But we had um, a limited sample size for howler monkeys from Santa Rosa. So to supplement our howler data, we also included data collected on the same species of howler monkey on the same shared fruit species, but at Isla Agaltepec in Veracruz, Mexico. And I'll note that while this increased our sample size and they're the results, uh, results I'm gonna be telling you guys about today, we found the same pattern of results when we only looked at the Santa Rosa um, data set with our limited um, howler monkey data from that site. To collect the data, we used continuous an focal animal sampling. Basically, when a monkey was engaged in a feeding bout, um, we recorded all the senses used to investigate each fruit leading up to that fruit either being eaten or rejected. So a monkey might sniff a fruit, it might bite it and then reject it. Or it might touch it, then eat it. Or it might eat a fruit directly off the branch and not use any senses at all. And these are all considered foraging sequences. For this project, we only included foraging sequences on fruits of six plant species or morphotypes that were consumed by the three primate species. But even by, with filtering the data by the shared fruit species, we're able to assemble a fairly large behavioral data set of 24,271 foraging sequences. And we found that there were significant differences between species in how often olfaction, touch, and taste were used to investigate fruits during the foraging sequences. So this is a graph of incidence rate ratio for olfaction. And I'm not gonna go into the details of the statistics and models, um, I can after, but basically this is depicting the relative incidence of sniffing during a foraging sequence for howler monkeys and capuchins relative to spider monkeys, which will always be the line at one throughout all of these figures. Um, and this controls for effects of individual monkey, plant species, and color vision ability. And I'll come back to color vision in a little bit. And what this figure shows is that spider monkeys sniffed fruit significantly more often than capuchins or howler monkeys. But there was no significant difference in sniffing behavior between howler monkeys and capuchins. For touch, capuchins use manual touch the most frequently and significantly more often than either spider monkeys or howler monkeys. But spider monkeys also use manual touch significantly more often than howler monkeys, which is interesting if you know anything about spider monkey hands, and we'll get to that shortly. And finally, we quantified the use of taste as how frequently an individual bit of fruit and then rejected it. So this allowed us to get around issues of trying to separate it out, biting for taste and then biting to eat. Um, so if they bit it and rejected it, we assume that taste was involved in that rejection. And we found that both capuchins and howler monkeys did not differ from each other, but were significantly more likely to bite and reject a fruit compared to spider monkeys. So to recap, for olfaction, Behavioral results found that spider monkeys used sniffing the most frequently, while capuchins and howler monkeys didn't differ. Capuchins use manual touch the most, followed by spider monkeys, and finally howlers used it the least. And both howler monkeys and capuchins use taste more frequently than spider monkeys. So yes, wild primate species vary in sensory behaviors even when assessing the same fruits. And we can now look at the first part of our second question. Are these behavioral differences predicted by dietary specialization? So remember, spider monkeys and capuchins are both considered more frugivorous than howler monkeys, with spider monkeys being ripe fruit specialists. And to some extent, dietary specialization does predict behavioral differences. The most frugivorous species, um, spider monkeys, use olfaction the most, and both frugivores use manual touch more often than the folivore. However, capuchins, despite being more frugivorous than howler monkeys, didn't differ in how often they use sniffing or taste when assessing fruits. So our next question, are these behavioral differences predicted by sensory anatomy? And to examine this question, we chose four anatomical structures that have been previously used as proxies for sensory reliance and collected data on them for capuchins, spider monkeys, and howler monkeys. For olfaction, we use two metrics, 
The first was the volume of the main olfactory bulb, um, this, the part of the brain there in blue in this sketch of a uh, capuchin brain. So this is the part of the brain that receives the projections from the olfactory receptors and is involved in processing olfactory information. So main, our MOB volume and total brain volume were collected from the literature for capuchin, spider monkeys, and howlers. And for our comparison across the three species, we used absolute MOB volume, but we also calculated a relative measure of MOB volume that controls for total brain size and phylogenetic history. Basically, um, we collected MOB and total brain volumes for a number of anthropoid primates and performed phylogenetic least squares regressions to calculate residuals. Because we observed basically the same pattern of results for the absolute volume and the corrected volume, I'm going to only talk about the absolute volume, but assume the pattern is the same for um, phylogenetically controlled um, measure too. And absolute volume itself is an important metric because it represents a measure of the total number of olfactory neurons in a given species. And absolute volume is significantly correlated with the number of identifiable smells in humans. So this result was pretty straightforward. Spider monkeys had the largest MOB volumes, while capuchins and howler monkeys had relatively similar volumes that were much lower than what we see in spider monkeys. And many of the results in this sort of anatomical section are going to be descriptive like this rather than statistical because this is more of a case study kind of approach. The second anatomical proxy for olfaction we looked at was the surface area of the nasal turbinates or um, conche. These are the narrow curved shelves of bone in the nasal cavity that are covered in olfactory epithelium. So a larger surface area would correspond to more olfactory epithelium, presumably more receptors and more investment in olfaction. We directly measured the surface area from CT scans of two howlers, 15 spider monkeys, and oh, oops, forgot, two capuchins. Um, and we did this um, by extracting nasal terminates from the scans and visualizing them as 3D surfaces, then measuring the surface area. So this image is from one of the howler monkeys. It's a superior view looking down from above, and the yellow areas are the nasal terminal areas. Like the MOB, we compared absolute nasal terminal surface area as well as a size and phylogenetically controlled metric for relative surface area. And we performed phylogenetic least squares regressions of nasal terminal surface area and cranial geometric mean for 43 primates. But again, the measure of relative surface area showed the same pattern of results as the absolute area. So I'm just going to talk about the absolute results. And what we found was sort of the opposite of the MOB results. The species with the largest absolute and relative terminal surface area was the howler monkey, while the smallest area was in the spider monkey. And when we compared these um, measures across all the individuals we sampled, this difference approach significance P was 0.06. And we suspect if we had a larger sample size, it would have achieved significance in the Kruskal Wallace test. So adding this proxy to our table, again, you can see spider monkeys and capuchins are much lower in surface area than howler monkeys. Unfortunately, data on anatomical proxies for manual touch itself are scarce, and they're limited to a couple contradictory studies of mechanoreceptor densities um, with limited numbers of species. So we focused on the ratio of thumb to index finger length, which is an established measure of manual dexterity and thus likely a proxy for the importance of on manual touch. And we measured the thumb and index finger lengths from digital pictures of our species, including pictures from cadaveric um, specimens that we have. And we supplemented our measurements with published data on either finger lengths themselves or on thumb to index finger ratios that were published. And we found that there were significant differences between howler monkeys, spider monkeys, and capuchins in the thumb to index finger ratio. Um, Spider, several spider monkeys were lacking external thumbs, which is consistent with previous reports. So this figure shows box plots of the ratios for howlers, spider monkeys, and capuchins. And you can see that capuchins had significantly higher ratios, meaning longer thumbs relative to their index fingers than howler monkeys or spider monkeys. We found no significant differences between spider monkeys and howler monkeys. However, again, we suspect this is a sample size issue and we're working to get more hand photos or hand prints for these species. And we've even put out a call on Twitter for quality hand photos. So let's throw these into the table here. Okay, for taste, we use the density of fungiform papillae on the tongue. So these papillae house taste buds and taste receptors. And increased papillae density is associated with increased taste sensitivity. 
And you can see the papillae here as these raised bumps in the tongue. And this is actually a really fun um, activity you can do at home or in a classroom lab. Use blue food coloring to dye your tongue, and then you take a picture of it and you can count the density of your papillae in the anterior half centimeter of the tongue. And then um, I've done it in class before, and then you have students test for differences between sexes um, in fungiform papillae density, which is supposed to be present in humans. So data on fungiform papillae were collected from Laura Alport's um, dissertation, where she meticulously collected data on the tongues of both cadaveric and living primates. And she included data from 14 howler monkeys, four spider monkeys, and 12 capuchin monkeys. It was a different species of capuchin, but we included it here. And we found significant differences between species in a Kruskal Wallace test, and this result this was driven by a significant difference between capuchins and howler monkeys, which had the highest and lowest densities of fungiform papillae, respectively. So adding these to the table, on average, capuchins had almost twice the density of fungiform papillae as spider monkeys, which had twice the density relative to howler monkeys. So now that we have all of this um, anatomy data, are the behavioral differences predicted by sensory anatomy? And for olfaction, we do see a nice relationship between sniffing behavior and the size of the main olfactory bulb. Spider monkeys sniff the most often and they had the largest MOBs. Capuchins and howlers didn't differ in sniffing behavior and they had relatively similar MOBs. And this makes sense. Um, studies have shown that active sniffing, like the active sniffing is known to activate the main olfactory bulb. But we see almost the opposite effect for nasal turbinal surface area where howler monkeys have the highest surface area. This means that howler monkeys have more surface area devoted to olfactory epithelium in the nose than spider monkeys. So we're seeing different patterns in the relationship between olfactory behavior and sensory anatomy, depending on which anatomical proxy we're using. For touch, the anatomy and behavior again match somewhat. Capuchins have the highest thumb to index ratio and use manual touch the most. But what's interesting is that spider monkeys, despite having the smallest ratio, in fact, often lacking a thumb at all, still use touch more often than howler monkeys. And the concordance between this proxy of manual dexterity and the use of touch in capuchins makes a lot of sense. Capuchins are famous extractive foragers, and they're the only neotropical primates that have thus far been observed to use stone tools. The use of touch by spider monkeys, despite their vestigial thumbs, supports the hypothesis that touch is selectively important for frugivores in assessing fruit ripeness. And in fact, we observed behavioral innovation in spider monkeys to adapt to their lack of thumbs. They instead place and squeeze fruit along the length of their index finger. Surprisingly for taste, we found that the two species that had the highest use of taste behaviorally during fruit assessment, capuchins and howler monkeys, had the low, highest and lowest densities of fungiform papillae. So this result may suggest that fungiform papilla density itself is not a good proxy for predicting when taste is used behaviorally to reject a fruit. Um, and there are good possible reasons for this. Fungiform papilla density does not tell us anything about which particular taste receptors are present in the papilla or how many taste receptors are present. So it's possible that species differ in how many sweet or bitter taste receptors they have within a papilla in the anterior tongue. And the density of papillae itself may just be too rough of a metric to be getting at um, these kinds of different uh, differences with behavior and affects relationships with behavior. So finally, we wanted to know if these behavioral differences were predicted by sensory genes. And for this, we looked at the number of functional olfactory receptor and bitter taste receptor genes in each species. Unfortunately, the genes underlying touch are still not well understood, so we only focused on olfaction and taste. Both of these proxies have been used in primates, mammals, birds, and reptiles as a measure of sensory reliance. To calculate the number of functional genes, we use genome sequencing reads for each of the three species and map the reads onto the human um, reference olfactory receptor genes or taste receptor genes. And we found pretty similar numbers of functional olfactory receptor genes across the three primate species. Spider monkeys and capuchins were nearly identical at 401 and 398, respectively, despite differing significantly in their use of sniffing behavior. Howler monkeys had slightly less functional genes at 390, but this was only 2.7% lower than spider monkeys, so possibly negligible. So no, the number of functional OR genes does not seem to correlate with sniffing behavior in these three species. 
For bitter taste receptors, the TASTE-2R genes, howler monkeys had 15% more functional genes than capuchins or spider monkeys. Um, this makes sense for detecting toxins in leaves. While the higher numbers of TASTE-2R genes in howlers match their increased use of biting and rejecting fruit, capuchins and spider monkeys don't really differ in the number of functional genes despite differing significantly in behavior. And there was one other proxy of sorts that we wanted to explore. It's how variation in color vision, so the number of functional opsin genes, is associated with these um, non-visual sensory behaviors. So remember I mentioned at the beginning that many neotropical primates have polymorphic trichromacy, where some females are trichromats, while males and homozygous females are dichromats. And presumably, trichromats will be better at using vision to detect ripe fruit. So we wanted to test whether dichromats use non-visual senses more frequently to assess fruit. And previous work on capuchins um, at this site suggests that dichromats use smell more often than trichromats. And we had color vision genotypes for all of the individuals in the capuchin and spider monkey data sets. And we know that all howler monkeys are routine trichromats, so they're all trichromats. And we used models that controlled for individual monkey, primate species, and plant species um, to explore for these effects on, of color vision status. And what we found was a significant effect of color vision on olfactory behavior and taste behavior. So dichromats sniffed fruits 2.6 times more often, and they bit and rejected fruits 2.2 times more often. However, there was no effect of color vision on the frequency of manual touch. So these results suggest that in primates, dichromats are using other senses to compensate for not having that red-green color channel. So to sum up, going back to our research questions, for the first one, yes, there is interspecific variation in how the senses are used during fruit assessment. For the second question, things are a little more complicated. There was some correlation between dietary specialization and behavioral differences in sensory use. Um, and there were some anatomical structures that correlated with behavior, mainly the main olfactory bulb volume. But there wasn't much of a relationship between the OR or taste receptor gene repertoire sizes and sensory behavior. So does this mean that these metrics aren't very good proxies of sensory reliance? And except for maybe fungiform papillae density, I think it's actually more complicated than that. And what we may be seeing are effects of differences in scale and sensory modality. For example, the number of functional olfactory receptor or taste receptor genes determines the number of compounds that a species can detect. And this may be an adaptation for differences in dietary breadth, but the breadth of OR or taste receptor gene repertoires may not be particularly relevant at the level of fine scale food selection that our behavioral data are measuring. So it's a difference of scale. And our results are particularly interesting in terms of proxies for olfaction. Of the non-visual senses, olfaction has been one of the most often investigated anatomically and genetically. And we found pretty contradictory patterns across the different proxies and the behavior. There was a match between main olfactory bulb volume and sniffing behavior during fruit assessment, with spider monkeys appearing then the most reliant on olfaction in those metrics. But the proxy for olfactory epithelial surface area suggested howler monkeys are investing more in olfaction and spider monkeys the least then there was no difference in the number of functional olfactory receptor genes. So what's going on here? Why don't these proxies appear to correlate with each other? And we think these different anatomical molecular proxies are actually measuring different modalities within olfaction. And I touched on this a little in the previous slide with the OR genes. The number of functional OR genes reflects the number of different odorants a species can detect. So we could think of that sort of like it's olfactory acuity. How fine-grained is the olfactory system at detecting different types of compounds? But nasal turbinal surface area is a measure of how much olfactory epithelium a species has to detect an odorant. More epithelium would suggest more olfactory receptors, but it doesn't necessarily have to correlate with the number of different types of receptors. So a species could have a large number of receptors for only a few types of odorants. And this would provide greater olfactory sensitivity and increased ability to detect low levels of a particular odorant, but it could still have low um, breadth. And it's interesting that the pattern of main olfactory bulb volume differences between our three species doesn't seem to correspond with either of these other two metrics, and we're not sure why. Um, I would expect it to, and so we're collecting data to explore these relationships between olfactory proxies in more detail across a larger primate sample. But the discordance that we found in these neotropical primates for olfaction matches what Steiger and colleagues found for birds, where the snow petrel had the largest main olfactory bulb volume, behaviorally relies on olfaction, 
but has one of the lowest numbers of functional OR genes in their data. So the snow petrel may need greater olfactory sensitivity to detect a few key compounds for foraging or navigation, but it does not need to de detect a large number of odorants. That doesn't mean it has a reduced reliance on olfaction. It just has a reduced reliance on one particular modality within olfaction. So some take home points from this project, we took a sort of case study approach to looking at questions of sensory behavior and proxies of sensory reliance, focusing on three species. Behavioral data sets on sensory usage like we've assembled are really rare, which limits larger scale comparative analyses, but we're hoping to encourage other field workers to include sensory behaviors in their ethograms. For dietary specialization, we found a clear relationship between frugivory and the use of manual touch. And despite having a moderate thumb to index finger ratio, filivorous howler monkeys did not use manual touch very often when assessing fruits. And in fact, they tended to just grab the branch and pull it toward their face and bite the fruit off it. So this result supports recent hypotheses by Domini and colleagues that increased manual touch sensitivity is associated with frugivory and detecting fruit ripeness and that frugivory may have been a critical precursor for the evolution of the highly refined manual dexterity and touch sensitivity observed in humans. However, we're currently lacking good data on anatomical and molecular proxies of touch. So here we used a proxy of manual dexterity, but that's not really a proxy of touch itself. And so this is something we're currently um, working to collect. We're collecting data um, and applying for funding, and we're going to be exploring this further. We have collaborations with veterinarians and wildlife sanctuaries in Costa Rica to collect tissue samples, and we'll be comparing mechanoreceptor density and gene expression in the hands of these and other primate species. We also found support for the hypothesis that dichromats com compensate for their reduced color discrimination ability by increasing the use of their non-visual senses when assessing fruit, specifically taste and smell. This suggests a level of flexibility in the use of different senses within a species. And it would be interesting to see how plastic these anatomical or molecular proxies are and whether they differ with color vision status in polymorphic trichromatic systems. For example, do dichromats differentially express any taste receptor genes in their tongues? Studies in humans suggest that taste receptor gene expression can be pretty plastic. It can vary with age, sex, and with pregnancy status. Um, although I'm not sure if anyone has looked in humans at taste receptor gene expression and color vision deficiencies. And I'm also not sure if anyone's looked at how color vision status influences plasticity of olfactory anatomy, but these would be really interesting avenues to explore. But one of the biggest take home points of this project, I think, is that we really need to refine how we think about proxies of sensory reliance and think critically about how we interpret their variation. Different proxies can represent different levels of sensory detection, um, from a global measure of dietary breadth, as measured by gene repertoire, to fine scale food detection, as um, our behavioral data were um, getting at. Proxies can also represent different modalities of a sense. A small olfactory gene repertoire, for example, does not necessarily mean that olfaction is not selectively important to a given species. It may mean one modality of olfaction is less important. So we need to be careful with how we discuss and interpret ecological differences in these proxies and avoid overgeneralizations like olfaction is not important to folivores when studies are often only looking at one proxy or one modality of olfaction. And I'd like to thank all the field assistants and other folks that helped collect all the behavioral data sets and the funding sources that supported us um, and I guess open up for questions. Let me stop sharing. Okay, um, that was awesome so much. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I, um, I will, uh, s s people can answer questions uh, directly if they wanna unmute themselves. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can write um, questions into the chat box. Um, and uh, I, uh, while we're waiting for other people to weigh in, um, I, and you know, um, because I am hosting today, I'm going to just ask the first question, which is, um, this work is just uh, so compelling, and and this was kind of the culminating point um, at the end of your conclusions about how important it is to look at. Um, all different parts of a suite of adaptations to really understand what's going on and that you can have, for want of a better term, many pathways to mm -hmm. the same kind of functionality in the animal. Yeah. And so um, I 
would, uh, you know, without, you know, I'm not putting you on the, um, under the microscope to name any names or anything like that, but it seems like quite often we see evolutionary stories for a particular trait or adaptation um, that often um, hinge on just one clue looked at mm -hmm. in isolation. And so um, I would really like to invite you to speak to uh, how this work has opened up the lens through which you look at um, ap adapt adap adaptation <laughs> narratives. And mm -hmm. um, if you could talk about like another, um, you know, not necessarily about sensory perception, but uh, places where you see people checking off the same sets of boxes that you are, um, or places where you think that there's been a really strong adaptation narrative that's been told that hasn't really done these kinds of confirmatory checks, or uh, could you speak to that? Um, <laughs> However you want. <laughs> uh, it definitely has changed how I think about things. It was sort of like, revelatory when um, me and my co-authors were like talking about this and how you'll read something that like, oh, olfaction is not important to humans. Oh, olfaction is not important to folivores, where in at least some other folivores, like marsupials, they, the sense coming from leaves can give a lot of quali food quality levels or information. And we don't know about that for primates because it's not been really explored yet. Um, so sort of thinking about how we need to just be more specific in what we're talking about too, like that this particular, we're talking about this one particular modality, but represent understanding that there are a bunch of different pathways to getting at the same thing. Yeah. Um, I've definitely seen conclusions and narratives of like, oh, humans, when they got fire, lost their need for bitter taste perception. And um, that all hinged on like something small and <laughs> that I, okay. yeah. Right. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to circle back and ask you some more questions, but we've got some coming up in the chat. So um, uh, Edward Zinker has asked you a question and I can read it to you, but it might. Oh, oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, I see it. Um, while I read it out loud to people that are listening along. Okay. So, have you looked at how weather, heat, cold, rain, clouds, et cetera, impact foraging primate species, specifically um, barometric pressure on the sinus cavity? That's a really great question. I know people do. Like, we have not looked at, um, we did not include weather in our, our analyses. I know other people, um, um, one of my um, collaborators on a different project looked at how rain and sunrise and everything affected foraging times in um, New World monkeys. But yeah, you'd think that if it, it changes the barometric pressure, it might affect the um, smell. And so, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone has. But. Hmm. All right, now we've got a question from Howard. Do you think that as one adaptation increases, it decreases the impact of other adaptations? So do you think there's trade-offs among adaptations? Like as nasal, tur nasal turbinate area increases, the addition of OR genes does not matter as much. I know that's a common idea that people suggest there might be trade-offs for sensory systems, but I would think like if you increase nasal surface or turbinal area, you're, um, you could still have more olfactory receptor genes dedicated to different types. So those two could go together positively. Um, it, so it's interesting that they don't. Okay, very cool. Um, so what's been the response? Um, again, you don't have to name any names. Um, among your, you know, people that are hearing you say like, you know, we, we, we can't use single proxies to infer these kinds of adaptive complexes and, um, or, or we can, but we have mm -hmm. to be somewhat more humble in our interpretation of them and the extent to which um, we've actually excluded alternative explanations. Um, how are people responding to this? Uh, um, this is actually the first time I've presented it. So we, um, we've been writing the paper um, all summer and it was supposed to be at um, IPS in August, but did not happen. So, so this is the first time it's been presented. <laughs> okay. Wow. Oh, well, very, very Google. Uh, yeah. Cause I, you know, I mean, one has to think that this will be um, revelatory for a lot of people. 
um, mm -hmm. because it, it's going to change a, a lot of different kind of research approaches to understanding these kinds of adaptations. And so I'm, of course, thinking of how it's going to complicate, um, you know, program officers and review panels for NIH and National Science Foundation and, and these kinds of things where the, you know, you know, multiple methods yeah. of research approach are going to be quite important. Yeah. Um, while we or, or at least specifying that, okay, we're only looking this, we know that this specific modality is all worth testing and we can't make claims about others. So follow-up question. Um, it, it, these species are, at least in some areas of their distribution, they're sympatric, aren't they? Yes. So, so Ours are. Yeah, and maybe you said this in the talk and I, I missed it, but um, how my, I mean, so they're, some of the foods they're eating are overlapping, as you said, mm -hmm. and so there's got to be some degree of interspecies competition or a sequence of access to different preferred food items. And so how might these species adaptations for sensory perception or their ability to digest foods at different levels of ripeness. So they're, so yeah. they're obviously interconnected, right? They have yes. a common ancestor, yeah. but they also um, are impacting each other's evolution through competition on these preferred re food resources. Yes. Can you speak to that? Um, I agree that it's something that like they are all, they are competing and they're all in the same environment. They're eating the same foods and it, could be that um, howler monkeys are eating less ripe versions because they have to. Um, and that might be why they're biting and rejecting them more often. <laughs> they're just not good. Um, whereas spider monkeys are ripe fruit specialists, so they might that might be part of what's going on. They're like going and finding the the ripe ones using other or using those senses, and they're larger than capuchins. <laughs> All right. Uh, cool. Okay. So um, at this time, I'd like to ask everybody to give another round of applause to Professor Vu and um, thank you so much. For no, thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. <laughs>